Okay, hello. So I'll be continuing with the talk. Uh, can I qu quickly get a show of hands who's here in the previous session? Okay, most people. Good. Retention. Yay. So, first of all, what is PGO? Does anyone know? So, it's profile guided optimizations. And uh, the idea is that you compile your code once with your compiler with some in special instrumentation, with some compiler flags. After that, the resulting binary, you run it for your training data, like a typical workflow for your program. And that generates, the binary itself generates a profile of uh, which functions are getting called and uh, what needs to be in line, actually. And after that, you recompile your program again using that profile, and you feed that profile to the optimizer. So the next time the compiler optimizes it and uh, links the program together, it actually knows what really needs to be in line, what is more, ho what is more cold and what's more hot. And uh, typically, the gains from this are like 10, 15 percent, 20 percent, depending on the software. So why am I talking about uh, runtime performance when I talk uh, about compile times? Well, we'll see a bit later, because this is obviously two times compiling your program. It's low, right? So build systems. Well, there are many, many, many build systems. And uh, there are also some meta build systems, and some which are sort of in between. And uh, if you're just calling your compiler directly like that, that's not a build system, because you always compile <laughs> everything. And uh, what are the, what's the point of build systems? Well, they track dependencies, so you can actually have minimal rebuilds. Uh, and you actually rebuild only the minimum set of things which have to be recompiled recomp and relinked. And also, you cannot scale without the build system. And uh, you cannot easily refactor and uh, restructure your code without the build system. You also need uh, some way to integrate your tools, and build systems can help with that as well. And uh, they're not created equal. Some of them are not that good, and there are different trade-offs. And it's a huge, huge topic. It's a worthy topic of uh, a few hours of lectures. But here we're going to just focus on the compile time aspect of uh, everything. So there's some old build systems like MS Build and Make. And uh, they're suboptimal in tracking the dependencies and uh, the detection of uh, changes. And uh, we're going to just mention a few techniques about them and uh, maybe which are the best build systems out there in terms of speed, not usability. So Ninja, Fast Build, and Incredible Build are probably some of the fastest ones. And um, they, as far as parallelism goes, they're, they have a very, very good scheduler for what to compile in parallel. For Make, you can uh, actually pass the minus J flag and uh, the number of cores you want to utilize. So you can also use make in a parallel way. But uh, sometimes, depending on how your make files are written, the parallelization is not that great. Depends. And for MS build, you can uh, pass the MP flag to a project. So when a project is compiled, actually, all of the different sources are compiled uh, in parallel. But MS build has some problems like, um, the inability to parallelize um, dependent DLLs, their compilation. Like DLL A depends on DLL B, but they can be compiled in a parallel. They just have to be linked one after the other because one of them depends on the other or something like that. But they at least can be compiled uh, in parallel. But uh, the schedule or famous build doesn't, does, doesn't do that as far as I know. But uh, Incredibility is uh, one add-on to Visual Studio which can fix that. Actually, Incredibility, it's a paid solution but you can use it for free uh, even after the first 30 days of uh, the trial. And uh, you, won't just have, you just won't have a distributed build. You'll have uh, the better scheduler in your Visual Studio. And you'll also be able to use the build monitor for free. And uh, what else about MS Build? So sometimes there's threat over subscription. Because um, if you're building projects in parallel, and uh, also, each project is building its source files in parallel. You can easily end up with much more threads than you actually have cores. At least I, I've heard that this has been an issue previously. I'm not sure how the latest Visual Studio, if that it still has those issues with MS Build, but uh, maybe. So some people 
actually managed to use Ninja instead of MS Build in Visual Studio, like with custom commands and uh, things like that. So it's a way to actually change Visual Studio to use Ninja. And uh, also there's this great article by Bruce Dawson about uh, making compile times fast through parallel compilation for Visual Studio. It goes very much in depth about uh, how to actually see different things which are being built in parallel, wh when what gets finished, and uh, how you can actually fix those things. And also with Unity builds, you should be careful, with, again, with long poles, which are big Unity source files, which for some reason ended up with the heaviest source files inside of them. So they compile for way, way, way longer than other Unity source files. And your still full build has to wait for that single last Unity source file. Also, modern link time optimization or link time code generation technologies, whatever it's called in different compilers, it's also parallelizable. A little bit on meta build systems. Well, they're about uh, one canonical description of the project. And um, with that, uh, through that canonical description, you can generate build files for different uh, build systems. And uh, hopefully, project files for IDEs. But this means that you have one more extra step in compiling your code. You actually have to generate the build files for the build system. And, uh, but at least meta build systems are usually extensible and uh, you can implement a new backend for a new build system inside of CMake or other such meta build systems. So a little bit on CMake, it's the meta build system we love to hate. It's sort of the industry standard by now. And for it, uh, sometimes the generation phase can be a bottleneck, especially when you have like more than a thousand targets inside of your big project, like in the case of LVM. And uh, especially if there are many checks, if something is present, something compiles, checks like that, they can be sped up with, uh, for example, that module which is on GitHub, CMake checks cache. So if your project is uh, so huge, you can use that for CMake. And also, I explained what PGO is. So just thought you might compile CMake yourself with profile guided optimizations. So you can use CMake on your project and on your, your CMake list files. And to after that, rebuild CMake to be as fast as possible for your exact case. So I've used many times this, and uh, it's been enough for me to debug uh, if a build is having holes in its parallelism. In this case, we see a drop between the, do, the two spikes. And uh, in a perfect world, when we're building, the CPU utilization will not stop be 100%. But uh, this is very crude. This is only for simple projects. And uh, again, you should definitely check out that article by Bruce for a further discussion in debugging parallelization of builds. And if you use the IncrediBuild uh, build monitor, it looks something like this. You see each and every separate build task or job or whatever, how long it takes, uh, what is stalled because of what else, and uh, where you actually have holes where you actually can optimize things. So in terms of speed, maybe maybe fast build is one of the fastest ones, may, maybe the best. Uh, because Not just because I haven't tested it myself, but it has Unity builds out of the box support for them. pre compiled headers, caching, distributed builds, and uh, many other goodies. But sadly, it still doesn't have a CMake backend for it. So it's a specific build system. Ninja is maybe one of the fastest ones which are being used much more widely than fast build. And uh, CMake can generate Ninja files and also GN, which is a meta build system which generates only Ninja files. It's like the higher level language for Ninja. And uh, maybe IncrediBuild and uh, TUP. I haven't invested TUP, but I've heard that maybe it's the fastest thing possible ever. And uh, I still haven't looked into these build systems, but uh, I would count on Buck and Bazel at least being uh, fast, like because of they're from Facebook and Google. Like they have a better scheduler for parallelization. They don't have such stalls in their parallel builds. That's what I would expect. But this is like a big topic which deserves uh, a lot of exploration and a uh, separate talk. And uh, one other note about build systems. For example, if you have many, many shared objects and uh, you rebuild only one of them, and many other shared ob objects depend on that DLL. But uh, the exported binary interface, the ABI, doesn't change at all. In theory, all the other, obj all other targets shouldn't be relinked. But uh, in nowadays, uh, in build systems, they will be relinked. 
and um, there are some techniques where you can actually detect if the ABI has changed and relink only if the ABI has changed. And uh, this is like a possible build system improvement which I would like to see implemented in time in all build systems. Uh, um, internal and external linkage. The idea is that if you have some source files with um, like uh, implementation specific details like uh, some variable which will be used only there or some function, they should be marked uh, as static or inside of an anonymous namespace so they have internal linkage. They cannot be accessed through a forward declaration from another source file and uh, that's a uh, a little bit uh, less burden on the linker because it has to deal with less exported symbols from object files when, it sh when it is stitching them together. And also, if you have um, such an internal linkage function inside of a source file and it's inlined everywhere it's used, uh, then it can be entirely removed from the binary, the original function. It doesn't have to be present in the binary at the end because it can't be referenced from other source files anyway. It has internal linkage. And uh, if you want to use Unity builds and you're using anonymous namespaces and uh, such internal linkage, it might be a good idea to actually think about the names of the variables with such linkage or just put them inside of some other named namespace so it's easy to disambiguate. Or we can just wait for the patching clank for support for Unity builds to come in. But uh, this shouldn't be like a big optimization. This is not one of the things which will cut uh, down your build times in half. This is like a percent, but uh, maybe it sometimes matters. And it also matters for the size of your binaries at the end. So static and dynamic linking, it's again a huge topic, but uh, as f we're concerned only with compile times and link times, so the gist of it is that you should prefer dynamic linking over static any, any day you want. I mean. Any given Sunday, I would choose to link dynamically for fast debug builds instead of uh, static linking. Because I can link statically if I want to for the final release build to have the optimal performance. But if I want actually, if I have a modular code base with different components, the linking will be, when you link with dynamic libraries, you'll be just using the exported interface and not the entire 10, 50, 100 megabyte object file which you'll have to link. And uh, yeah, use dynamic linking. And uh, if you're using dynamic linking, on Unix, by default, all symbols are exported, which is actually the opposite to Windows. And uh, in this case, Windows got the default right. But we can make Unix and uh, Linux uh, behave like Windows by supplying the visibility hidden flag. And then nothing is exported by default. So what happens is that we actually now have to explicitly annotate our API what has to be exported. So we're very explicit about what symbols should be visible outside of our shared object. And this uh, improves link time. It also helps a bit with the runtime. Also the load times when the program is actually starting and the object files, not, not all object files, but shared objects are loaded into memory uh, because there are much less uh, externally exported symbols to fix up by the loader. In some extreme cases, it's been documented to like uh, 54, 45 times uh, faster load times for something with a lot of templates, which usually previously exported a bunch of things, but then all of them got hidden, except for a few important ones, and uh, load times got improved. Also, the sizes of your binaries are smaller when they don't export that much stuff. And for many, many more gritty details about symbol visibility, you should check out that page on the GC documentation. Also, if you don't want to annotate your APIs to explicitly say what should be exported. So you're not building with uh, a visibility hidden on Unix. You still want to export things, but you don't want to be explicit about them. You can at least use this middle ground uh, flag, a visibility inlines hidden. So at least the functions which are inline with an inline linkage inside of the binary, at least they won't be exported. So that will help with uh, such huge template uh, code base. And uh, how do we export symbols, actually? How do we explicitly annotate uh, the code? In this case, we have a symbol export and a symbol import uh, macro. And uh, depending on if DLL exports is defined or not, my API is either export or import. So this is a header which can be used both for building a DLL or a shared object which exports its symbols and for some other 
shared object or other target, which consumes that shared object and uh, it imports those symbols. And uh, the only difference is uh, if DLL exports is uh, defined or not. And in this case, we're exporting a full function and the entire class, my class, along with all of its methods. So a bit on linkers. Well, on Unix, you can switch from the default linker to gold. It's uh, actually a faster implementation of a linker. And uh, you can do it by supplying the fuz ld equals gold flag for GCC and Clank. And uh, it's not multi-thread by default, but you can actually make it multi-thread. And it's faster than the default one. LLD is uh, one other linker developed uh, as part of the LVM project, and uh, it's also multi-threaded by default. And uh, multi-threadedness multi aside, it's still faster than gold, so it's maybe the fastest linker out there right now. Um, when you're using um, debug info on Unix, it might be a good idea to actually split the debug info out of your binaries which you're emitting, so they're not uh, in the same binary but separate. Just like on Windows, you have separate PDBs and uh, binary files. And for CMake, there's that uh, link what you use. Um, I guess it's a, uh, I'm not sure if it's a property, but you should definitely check it out if you're curious about linking the absolute minimum amount of stuff you need. And uh, while we're on linkers, you can also build the linkers yourself with profile guard optimizations while they, they link your code and link time optimizations for the linker itself with a native uh, architecture. That's uh, if you really, really want to crank out the maximum performance of uh, your build tools. You build CMake yourself with profile optimizations, linkers, and compilers. What other flags do we have for linkers? For link time optimization, uh, there's been a lot of development in all of the compilers in the recent years. And uh, for Clang, there is this thin LTO, which is actually a scalable incremental parallel link time optimization implementation. And uh, if you want to know more about it, you should check out that talk from CPPCon last year. It's usable and uh, it's great. It's probably the fastest link time optimizer out there. There's some more info for GCC and uh, for Visual Studio. Again, there's also been a lot of improvements in the previous years. There's also the debug the fast link option, which is uh, about using a new, about generating a new format for PDB files, which are slimmer and uh, yeah, it says it's fast link, so it should be fast. I trust them. <laughs> um, what else? We should be using incremental linking. And uh, even for link time code generation, we can also have incremental linking. And uh, also, we can cramp, crank up the um, parallelization for the, incremental, for the link time optimi optimizer for Visual Studio. What is a compiler cache? Well, it's a compiler wrapper which does the following. You tell the compiler wrapper to compile a source file, and um, it first preprocesses that source file, just like any compiler. And um, after that, it hashes the result of the after the preprocessing. So it hashes the whole translation unit. And uh, together with a hash of the compilation flags and the compiler version used, it uh, makes a mapping between input and an output object file. So if the compiler cache doesn't have a cached object file for a translated translation unit, then it uh, invokes the compiler and actually compiles it, and then it caches that. So the next time you want to compile the same source file with absolutely the same source, so source code with the same flags and the same compiler, you still preprocess the file again with the preprocessor, but that's like some milliseconds. And after that, you get uh, the previously built object file for free. So the first run, when the cache is called, when there's no object files populated inside of it, the build might be even a bit like 5-10% slower than a normal full build. But that's okay, because consecutive full rebuilds will be way, way, way fast. You'll be paying only for preprocessing and linking. And all the object files will be already, already compiled for you. And uh, the thing is that these compiler caches, which work in this way, they work only for, they work best for full rebuilds. For example, for continuous integration, where you push a little change, so just a little bit of code is changed, and only it will have different object files for it generated. But all the other source files, you'd like to actually 
not compile them again, but reuse their previously compiled object files. So such compiler caches, they work best for full rebuilds and small changes somewhere in the code. So for Unix and uh, GCC and Clang, there are C cache, which is the most uh, famous one. For Windows, there are a few others for Visual Studio. Fast build, that build system, again, it has native support for caching. Um, there is also SC cache, which is for caching in the cloud. And uh, there's also stash.io, which is, again, for distributed caching in the cloud for Visual Studio only. It is paid. So ZAPCC is another caching compiler, but it's actually not a wrapper. It's a compiler itself. So how does it work? Uh, it's based on Clang, and uh, it's more like uh, 200,000 lines of code with modifications inside of the Clang code base. And uh, what it is actually is it's like a compilation server, which sits in memory and doesn't die. So each time you decide to compile more and more code, uh, it checks inside of the living uh, compilation server if uh, for that template uh, the instantiation is already cached or something like that. So the idea is to use it ma mainly for heavy template code. WebKit can compile for a few times faster just by using that compiler, even for a first run. So this is not for only for good only for uh, full rebuilds, but uh, even for first build, it might be it might give you much faster compile times. So it's not a wrapper; it's a compilation server with caching. So yeah, caches work usually best with full rebuilds, unless with the case of ZAPCC. And uh, C cache can be easily integrated with CMake. There are different ways. There are also a bunch of articles you can read, and uh, yeah, more articles. Again, these slides will be available online. They're available right now. And to the end, I'll provide with the link. Next up, distributed builds. Well, the idea is that um, we have many computers in our network and a scheduler. and uh, Whenever one of the computers needs a build, it tells the scheduler, help, yo, help me with uh, building all of these source files. And the idea is to reuse the underutilized sources, uh, I mean, cores from machines in the system. So you can either have dedicated slaves, like which are only for building dedicated machines, or you can even reuse the computing power of other developer machines. Because we have a lot of cores, but if we are as a developer compiling just a single source file, we're using only one core, and uh, the other cores are idle. And uh, we can lend them to someone else who actually needs to compile something big. So this route builds, yeah, that's the idea that many, many computers compile separate source files, and uh, code is flying around uh, through the network, object files. And uh, just like compiler wrappers, compiler cache wrappers, again, this is the most, imp most famous uh, such tool for distributed builds, and you can just prepend it to the call to the compiler itself. And uh, of course, you have to have this TC set up with uh, which computers are in the network, uh, how many cores each uh, computer is willing to give, and things like that. And uh, since they're prepended to the compiler, both the ra compiler wrappers, I mean the caches and the distributed builds, then we ha can actually chain them, and they work hand in hand. So we can cache and have distributed builds at the same time. And again, there are a few articles you can check out. And uh, what software can we use? So first of all, you should be watching out for network bottlenecks. Because uh, if you have some includes somewhere on the network, and all of the distributed builds, the build machines, they use those, they use headers remotely. They don't have those header files locally. Um, that can be sometimes a little bit slow. And uh, maybe it might be a good idea to sort the include directories you've supplied for compilation of your project in terms of hotness, where most often there's a header file which is actually needed in them. And uh, also bandwidth can be a problem when 50, 100 megabyte uh, object files start flying around from the different build machines. So yeah, you can use this TC, ice cream, is based on this TC, it's another solution, and uh, in Credit Build, that's their flagship product, it's distributed builds. And uh, that build system again, fast build, yeah, it supports distributed builds out of the box. And uh, one other article you can check out if you're curious more about this topic. 
So I talked about PGO and GCC and Clang have uh, such targets for bootstrapping them where you can actually PGO bootstrap the compiler and it can either get compiled with instrumentation from PGO, after that it can compile itself with uh, and generate a profile and then compile itself a third time using that profile to actually compile itself for the final time in the most optimal way for your architecture and your machine. But uh, I guess it should be possible to actually train the compiler not only on itself while it's bootstrapping, but on your particular code base as well. It makes sense to be possible. Um, what else? And uh, if you want to know more about this, you should check out this talk from CPCon a few years ago. It touches on many other such things. Actually, it was the inspiration for my entire talk. So hardware, some people told me today that they had a big problem with uh, build times and they just bought incredible build and lots of hardware. So how do we solve problems? Well, we throw money at it. Lots of lots of money and uh, yeah, lots of money. What can we do? Well, we can get more cores, more machines and more RAM. So when we're doing parallel builds on a single machine, we don't ever run out of RAM. I mean, that's basically what we do about uh, hardware. And also, we should have SSDs, but uh, if we have a lot of RAM, we can use RAM disks, which is actually something like a file system drive, but not on your SSD or hard drive, but on in the RAM itself. And uh, what would we put inside of it? Well, the output and the temporary directories. That w that's what makes more sense. When the compiler has to write a 100 megabyte object file, it will be even faster in a RAM disk than an SSD. And again, uh, that talk uh, from a few years on CPPCon by Matt, it touches on many other such issues. But uh, what if from all of, we've done all of these better build systems, uh, better templates, better inlining, whatever, and uh, we're still having issues. Maybe something else is bad. Maybe our architecture of the project itself is just messed up. Like the components are really, really badly designed. And uh, physical design is one thing which is often neglected and uh, almost nobody talks about it. Like, how do you actually separate code in different source files and uh, different source files should be in what components and shared objects and uh, every project starts out small, but uh, when they get big, if the physical design is not that good, they suffer and that's a price they have to pay until the end, whatever the end may be. And uh, when the physical design is right, then it's much easier to reason about components and modularity and uh, it's easy to refactor and uh, your builds can be faster. So there's this very good uh, introduction to physical structure for C++, like different thoughts, not very in-depth, but if you want to go in-depth, John Lekos from Bloomberg, well, that's something like his specialty for the past 25 years. He wrote a book uh, which is still relevant, very much relevant. He's also given many, many talks about um, how to actually physically structure your projects. And uh, he recently gave a good talk about modules and large scale development and what's upcoming and how we should think about all of that. And here's one other controversial article about physical design by the machinery. There they advocate for not including a header file from another header file ever. So they're making a game engine and they have this strict, strict policy of never having a header include another header file. So think about that. They're, they've gone to an extreme length just to enforce some rule which everybody has to abide, for, abide by just to keep this problem in the future at bay. So, and they say that uh, for five years of development they still haven't run into any fundamental trouble and they're very, very happy with their choice. So it's uh, something we can think about. How can we analyze dependencies? Well, CMake can output uh, about its build tree the dependencies in a GraphVis file. There are some different options how to generate it and what to get out of it. And after that, we can use the GraphVis program itself to actually visualize that graph inside of some, as an image and, uh, or maybe something interactive. So we can actually reason about what is dependent on what. And uh, I think that most build systems should support something like that out of the box. Um, 
Most of the tools I listed on the finding can I study include slide from my previous hour. Uh, most of them can be used for dependency analysis within the project. And uh, most of them also work with Gravis. So, yeah. Source Trail is one other interesting piece of software which is used for, it's commercial, but uh, it's very interesting about exploring code bases. And uh, it can also help you with figuring out what depends on what and what calls what. And uh, usually IDs also have uh, such dependency analysis between components. So here's an example from a few years about a boost variant, what it depends on. This is, uh, I think, generated with uh, GraphVis. And uh, yeah, we can see what one library depends on what other libraries. And uh, it's much easier to reason about, hmm, do I really need to depend on type index? Just a thought. I'm not saying anything in this case. So. Maybe modules will help us. They, they will save the world. And uh, they have the potential, certainly. So a brief history. The first proposal about modules was 14 years ago. It was by David, who was working on the EDG compiler. And uh, it's actually the only compiler who ever supported exported templates. And uh, actually, because of their support for exported templates, they helped uh, with the deprecation of exported templates. Um, what happened, there were a few proposals, and uh, they decided to drop it for, from C++11 and to head it into a separate TR. In C++, uh, I mean, in 2011, the first implementation, the implementation in Clang, the first one, work started on it by Douglas, and uh, of course, it didn't work right out of the box. Uh, a few years ago, there was the next uh, standardization push, the, f the next um, wave of proposals by Gabriel Dostreis, Mark Howe, and uh, Gordon Shoff. And uh, after a few revi revisions, they dropped it from C17 and they left it out a separate technical specification. And uh, right now, the hopes are that modules go into C20, but that's not certain if it will happen. And if you want to know the latest uh, news and um, latest proposals, here are they, they're listed. And uh, actually right now is the latest committee meeting uh, taking place in San Diego. And they're discussing, among other things, modules. So what's the motivation behind modules? Well, compile times, it's one of them, especially for big companies. And uh, preprocessor includes, they were really, they're really nasty. They, they're not clean. So many symbols are leaked, especially for implementation details. Um, there are many sometimes name clashes, like not just sometimes, there are often times. Uh, tooling is hard. Uh, we have to come up with workarounds like include guards, because that's include, include files are just uh, what C++ has until now. And also the include order method. How many times have you had to actually reorder the order of includes because some include uh, defines something or doesn't include itself something which actually depends on. And also, if we have modules, things will be more dry. We won't have to repeat ourselves that much. Well, in part about forward declarations, we'll have uh, less need of them. We'll be able just to import a module. And uh, also, when we're writing the module itself, we, can, we don't need to have a header and a source file. We can just export whatever we need right out of the source file. So we, we wouldn't have that much need for, for declarations and, and uh, such separation between headers and sources. So here's an example which builds with Visual Studio 2017. We import the std core module, which contains containers, strings, and um, IELTS streams and uh, almost everything. And we also export a module called M1. And for me, we export a get strings um, free function. Then in our main, we import again std core so we can use std all stream and std c out. And uh, we also import the M1 module. And we can easily call the get strings uh, free function right out there. So this compiles like this from the command line. So we still have to issue the um, specific compiler commands ourselves. 
and first we have to build the module and uh, to export it. After that, we need to build the other file just to compile it. And we need to reference the f other module. And then we have to link the two object files together. And uh, what we end up with uh, in the file system is this M1 IFC file, which is actually the binary module interface, which is when M1 is compiled, except for an object file, we also get a binary module interface file. So how do modules work? Well, these binary module interface files, they're consumed by importers. In order to import, you first need to have those BMIs. And also, they're produced when the compiler compiles a module interface unit. In this case, our first snippet at the top of from the last slide, it was the entire module with the module interface unit, the same thing. And uh, what do BMIs contain? Well, something like serialized uh, ASTs about uh, the exported symbols. So you can also export uh, templates like, li like that, which can you can also instantiate from other places when you import the module. And uh, unlike pre-compiled headers, the idea for modules is to for them to be composable. And also for you to be very explicit about what actually should be exported out of the project. Because in headers, you you, you want the banana, but you also got the gorilla. So. What do modules obsolete? What techniques uh, we will no, no longer need to do? The pimple idiom, which will almost entirely die, I think, Esp uh, except for the cases where you actually want your object file, I mean, not object file, but uh, class to be big, always just a single pointer. So when you really, really want to keep uh, ABI stability, you might want to still employ the pimple idiom. Also, for declarations, we'll mostly get rid of them because we'll be able to just import modules easily and uh, also just to, we wouldn't need uh, headers and sources that much. Precompiled headers will be mostly gone and uh, Unity builds also, I think, there will be much less need for them. What's the current state of modules? Well, big companies are invested in them because they really want uh, to save money both in developer time and probably a bit on electricity from all the builds and the tests they're running on build, huge build clusters. So all the three major compilers have implementations already working. They're not exactly the same, but uh, in time they will converge when the standard is out. And um, you can try them out. The future is still not clear because uh, there's on an ongoing discussion about around tooling and the syntax and uh, what actually should be possible. And uh, even when they're standardized, if it's C20 or 20 23, and they're implemented in a uniform way in compilers, uh, I'm not sure about the compile times. I mean, they wouldn't be more like, I've heard that um, they've gained like three times or two times faster compile times in certain places they've employed them. But, uh, and that might change in the future, it might be get more optimal, but for now it's, they just want to make it work. And uh, one big issue with modules is the support from build systems, because uh, it turns out that it's really, really hard to actually compile the binary module interfaces uh, in the proper order, because the build system doesn't know initially how to do that without scanning the project and the source files. And uh, currently, only build to as a build system supports modules out of the box, as far as I know. And uh, at least the guy who is developing it is very, very active in uh, in the committee about modules, precisely because of uh, the hardships. And even when we get uh, build systems which support uh, modules out of the box, we don't have to issue compiler commands ourselves. It w they will still be adopted slowly by users because. Not everybody is using the latest tool chains, and also they might have to change their source code. And uh, when your third party doesn't change their source code, and you don't want to change yours either, and uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we'll be dealing with legacy for a long time. And uh, I wouldn't expect the C++ world to have moved to modules in the next uh, five, six, seven, eight years, like uniformly. It will not be the common thing, in my opinion. More on modules, well, there's a lot more on modules. There are a bunch of talks which are all good and uh, they build sometimes one on top of each other. The latest ones, which is the most relevant, is from CPCon 
2018, just from two months ago, about the progress with C++ modules by Nathan Sidwell. He's working on the GCC implementation of modules, and uh, uh, he's doing it mainly for Facebook. I mean, Facebook are sponsoring that. And also, there are a bunch of other articles you can read about uh, modules and different problems and discussions about them. So what are the next steps after you've uh, employed absolutely every technique from this uh, lecture? Well, you might consider runtime C++ compilation and hot swapping. So you don't actually have to restart your entire program, but you can just rebuild a part of it and hot swap it at runtime. That's been possible for more than 25 years with C, but uh, it's not that widely used. But uh, in some cases, it makes a lot of sense. And it's not that hard to implement, actually. Um, you should check, make your source checkout faster. I mean, source checkout checkouts faster. Uh, you can make your tests compile a lot faster by just switching to my framework. It's the fastest, trust me. Um, what else? C test. When you're writing your tests with C test, they can actually be executed in parallel as well with the minus J option. Continuous integration, you, can, you should look at any way you can actually speed CI builds. And uh, you should integrate more tools in your ID so you don't have to leave the environment you use. And uh, oh shit, this one shouldn't be seen here. Anyway, uh, even if we have all of these rules, we need to enforce them somehow because Purely because of uh, human nature, we wouldn't be very strict about them and uh, things will be messy. So we need to have code reviews, automation, which rely on tooling. There are many tools which uh, do metrics about uh, code hygiene and uh, there are many Clang-based tools about uh, refactoring and just diagnosing Clang tidy. I think there will be a lecture right uh, after me in this very room about that. You should also enforce, like, if you if you have some rule which can be automatically detected or enforced, you can put it in a pre-commit hook so users don't commit code which doesn't follow the, those guidelines. And your CI can emit uh, notifications when anything is wrong. So you don't have just a single guy who is dedicated to fixing problems, but uh, actually whoever is the culprit gets the notification. And with this, I conclude my presentation. You can find all the slides online from that link. And uh, that's it. If you have any questions, now is the time. Anyone? Yeah, there's one on the left right, over there. Uh, do you know of any CMake support for these experimental module implementations? No, but I don't think there is. There isn't one? There is no uh, hack or experiment to mm, run? No. Okay. Ah, there is. Oh, or there isn't. Ah, there is. Okay, so so apparently there is. <laughs> uh, have you managed uh, actually to... Uh, uh, use uh, every each of the technologies that you uh, uh, that you uh, yeah that I presented uh, presented well uh, in uh, a single project. Well, no, because uh, there are too many, and uh, I haven't had the pleasure of working on such a big project that actually needs the employment of all of these techniques. For example, doc test employs just uh, source code modifications and writing your source in particular ways. But uh, I, when I develop it, I don't need C cache, for example, or distributed build for a single header framework. And uh, in the companies I've worked with, uh, progress is gradual. I mean, there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy you have to go through to just to make the CTO agree that some change should actually be made. And even if you want to employ all these techniques, it would take a lot of time if you have bureaucracy and such processes. I don't know. Hey, um, just to clarify on the CMake modules thing, uh, Stephen Kelly here. Um, there is a patch that somebody put on the, on the patch tracker. Um, it hasn't been accepted because we want to wait for modules to be standardized, really, or get more close to that. Uh, 
And also, something that's wrong with the patch is it requires you to make a lot more CMake changes than you really would want to. And a lot of that is due to the design of C++ modules itself. So um, you're right that it'll take a long time for build tools to catch up in order for people to make use of these things. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Anyone else? Well, I guess there's nothing. So, thank you very much. One more question. Ah, there, there's one more, there's one more. Let's get it. Uh, I was just curious when you said that the, there was this company that employed this rule that you cannot include anything in the headers. Do you, can you elaborate more on that? How is that possible to achieve? Well, they define their structures in header files. I'm not sure how some types don't reference other types, like by value, but uh, they do a lot of forward declarations. You should definitely check out the link. I mean, I, w I don't agree with them, but uh, they made a successful game engine in the past, which got sold to Autodesk. So they're like adequate software engineers, and uh, they continue to make software in this way. So I guess it's working for them for years. They're a team of at least five people, and it somehow works. But they forward declare a lot of things uh, by hand. That's all I can say. Any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot.